I'm Dylan Radigan. I've interviewed nearly every CEO and most world leaders during the past 25 years. And now I'm bootstrapping. I'm turning my attention to the new CEOs and the irrepressible entrepreneurs leading the next generation of innovation in the world. Welcome back to Tasty Live. I am Dylan Radigan. Time for another episode of Bootstrapping. Our guest today, David Chadwick, the company called Real Response, dates back to its founding in 2015. Its specialty allowing honest dialogue between athletes and people in the athletics business and their management, whether it's the team ownership or whether it's the administrative bodies, um, where David uh, obviously felt, and uh, based on the success of the business the last eight years, felt correctly that there was a breakdown between the real, the truth of whatever the athletic, the athlete's experience was and is, and the administration and ownership's relationship uh, with that experience. David, nice to meet you. Hi, Dylan. Nice to meet you too. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So where, where, where do you think the biggest breakdown is between athletes and management, whether it's an administration or a, or an ownership? Sure. I think the reality is, and speaking specifically to athletes, but it's really more athletic organizations. They are prominent, highly pressured environments where there is a desire to succeed. I mean, most of them are literally judged by win and losses. So this is a normal gauge of success. And, you know, for athletes specifically, um, they have a desire to not lose things like playing time or if they're a, on a college campus, perhaps financial aid. Um, and, and therefore, there's perhaps a reluctancy to speak up to a need or a concern or a question they have because they don't want to jeopardize those types of things that they have. Or if you look at an employee, you know, a lot of these employees that are working for sports organizations, this is their dream job. They're willing to take pay cuts. They're willing to move across the country to be a part of a professional sports league or franchise or whatever. So these folks are willing to take sacrifices. They're willing to live in pressured environments to succeed. And as a result, that can just compound sometimes to these types of, of inappropriate behavior or instances happen, happening that otherwise uh, would have gone unnoticed. So, And, I, and I, I want to get into the weeds with all of this, but I'm just thinking about it from the administrator or the owner's perspective. You're, you're you're offering me an anonymous feedback loop, which in negative anticipation, I'm like, okay, wh why do I need to open a portal for a bunch of people to complain? And on the other hand, I'm like, okay, if I open this portal and I get good information, then I can be more competitive and uh, a a... a I'll get more wins, I'll have more prestige, I'll have more success because I'll have better information and a better connection with my athletics organization. And I'm curious how you navigate between the, the negative expression of a feedback loop like this and the po positive one. Sure. It's a spectrum of reaction. As you can imagine, doing this almost a decade, I've heard everything. Um, I'd say on the beginning of this journey, we did get a lot of pushback of folks saying, you know, is it is it better just not to know? Because if you know about it, then you're held accountable, et cetera, um, with just the continual exam. And everybody complains all the time anyway. So, like, why do I need an organized complaint system? Exactly. You know, there's just been and this is unfortunate, but just so many examples of extremely prominent situations within organizations of abuse and misconduct and people coming forward and saying, I didn't feel like I had a way to speak up without that fear of retaliation. And I think we're at a place now that everyone agrees it's better to have something versus not having something. Um, and then it goes to your second response of, okay, if we do have something, what's the best way to set this up? And we're a believer of not setting this up just for the negatives, not just for the issues. It really is more about creating open communication, empowering people to be able to come forward because you may get positives. We see a lot of positives come through where people say, hey, I just want to let you know that my athletic trainer, Dylan, really helped me come back from an injury. I was in a dark time and, and you pulled me through it. Um, it. It could be a question that maybe people didn't feel comfortable tagging their name to, such as, hey, I'm really struggling right now with a mental health problem. You know, what resources are available to me? Or I'm aware of a peer or a colleague or a teammate that's really struggling because of something in their personal life. You know, how can I help him or her? And then obviously the concerns continue to fit in that in that bucket as well and the big issues that otherwise would have gone unnoticed. But, you know, from our perspective, it's about enhancing communication, opening up dialogue and, and creating conversations for people to be able to come forward and then equipping the leadership to build trust and positioning them in a way that, they can be responsive and really prioritize the well-being within their organization. 
and, and how do you filter the input? How do I just, how do I make a distinction between run of the mill gripes and complaints and a significant issue that I'm lucky to get ahead of because it's a real problem. Sure. So this really goes back to the bigger fundamental issue with anonymous feedback in general. Um, and I think some of the hesitation in the past of opening up anonymous feedback, you want things to be anonymous because you want people to feel comfortable when coming forward. But from the recipient's perspective, in absence of a system like ours, when it is anonymous and you find out about it, if you don't have enough information, you're now essentially stuck in the mud of knowing about something, but not enough to actually act on and actually truly make an impact. You know, through our platform, it allows, allows the person to be anonymous when they come forward, but it allows the recipient to create two-way communication back and forth with that person while as long as he or she so chooses to remain anonymous. Two, ask questions, point to resources, et cetera. So it allows you to quickly filter through what are those minor inconveniences that perhaps didn't need to come forward or they can be resolved quickly. And then what are those more serious ones that are going to need us to go back and forth, get the information that we need to actually launch a full-scale investigation. And so educate us a little. How, how does the portal work? Because you know, I'm, I'm imagining one complaint is, oh, they took out the vending machine and I like the vending machine. And you're like, well, I can't help you, right? And the yeah. other thing is, I don't feel safe. You know, I feel like my I'm in an unsafe place for whatever reason, and I need help. Yes. which would be sort of the most obvious at the other end of the spectrum from they took away the vending machine. Sure. So we would first help the organization decide how they want to position this. Is it just for the urgent, serious concerns? Are they open to kind of a broader communication feedback loop? Um, we saw a professional sports franchise implement last year, and they used wording that I thought was really well articulated. They said, in, in short, tell us whatever you think is important for us to hear. So putting the ownership on these adults to make that decision. And then something comes through, the organization could decide who are the folks that we from the onset want to be alerted and aware of what came through. So on a college campus, that might be the sport administrators for that specific sport. Um, it might be the, the the Title IX liaison for the athletic department. It might be the COO or the deputy. We, there's a lot of customization on that side. You know, with professional sports leagues or franchises or the Olympic national governing bodies or these integrity groups, it, it changes a lot. I'd say commonly it is those over HR or legal or some, some type of role there. So something comes through and then these recipients can decide, okay, what's our action plan from here? Do we need to respond back and get further information? Or do we want to loop in other specific domain experts? Maybe we're looping in our mental health experts so that they can be a part of the follow-up and guide the dialogue on what we need to say. Um, maybe it's something that we know could have legal ramifications and we want to loop in our outside counsel just to have another set of eyes and ears and market is privileged. So we have that moving forward. So there's a lot of ways that they can decide who's set up to receive this. How are we responding back? They can then build out internal notes to have records of what they're doing if they don't necessarily have a follow-up to the individual yet, but want to have a good timestamp on what's being done. And then they are able to collectively track, manage, label, um, filter, and have everything in one spot moving forward. Is there any reason why this couldn't be more broadly applied as an HR tool across all organizations, not just those that are uh, in the athletics world? Absolutely. And I, I'd say with the professional sports clubs, we already are using it as an HR tool because those are employees. It's being set up as a tool for employees to report you know, misconduct and those types of things that can happen within the workforce. So um, that is already happening. It's obviously a sports organization, but it's very much an HR tool in that example. And so then what is the real response business model? Yeah, so we're a SaaS platform. So we are um, a license that we sell directly to the organization. They would set us up. We would train them, um, have a full customer success team that's amazing to make sure that they feel supportive, uh, supported rather, and, and implemented and ready to go. And then we, we set them up to be able to use the platform thereafter. And then do you charge... A, a set fee for each organization or is it the, uh, by by the number of seats or headcount like how do you how do you model that it's really a combination um so we have several different products that we offer we have you know survey tools record keeping tools anonymous reporting tools etc even in anonymous reporting um sometimes we have organizations that say to us we have a specific group of people that we want to be able to communicate it's more of a closed loop model that has one pricing model versus others that say, look, we have 
anybody, we want anybody to be able to anonymously share information with us. So think like a um, United States anti-doping agency, anybody that has a tip related to doping, we want them to be able to contact us. So it would depend on how they want to set it up. Um, and then once we have that in mind, you know, how many users are going to be in the system? Is it specific to a you know small team or a few teams, or is it a much bigger implementation? And then with bundled discounts appropriately on, on how they go from there. And then is there a third party aspect to this where I'm a player or a, I'm, I'm part of some athletics organization, I'm being recruited by three different organizations, whether it's a pro, in the professional or whatever, and I can look at some version of a real response dashboard. To, I'm like, well, how is this team in San Francisco or this team in Texas or this team in New York? Like, Is there a visibility to the some of the information in the real response channels that's binary between the organization that is also accessible to third parties. Sure. So I would say we've seen partners use it on their own promotion to just be able to show a prospective employee or a student athlete, whatever, you know, here's our scores run by a, you know, a credible third party. It's interesting you asked that though, because that was actually my original idea. Um, I thought that we may have implications to be able to replicate a TripAdvisor or a Yelp or a Glassdoor. And at the time, the college space um, with student athletes being able to provide those ratings that could be used publicly and ended up quickly with my market research, realizing there was more of a need on the internal side versus the external. But um, it's it's something that in a very similar example, as we see in other sectors, people using their data if they, if they want to be able to, to have validation on their culture and well-being. Yeah, because my, it's interesting you say it because I was listening to you. It's like, oh, it's like glass door for sports yeah. or for sports culture. But your point is that they that the value proposition is has at this point is much higher by protecting the confidence of the dialogue than by uh, sharing access to the dialogue. Sure. So this began as a class project while I was an undergrad. And at the time it was called Real Recruit because that was my idea as I thought this could have recruiting impl implications. I met with- is that, because, is that because you went to a school you didn't like and you're like, I wish I knew ahead of time that this place had this, 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 this it, was it, it, or had friends? I mean, I, I just, I, I mean, I, and I don't say that to make you indict any particular organization, but I'm just thinking there's a whole thing where it talks about forget sports, you know, 95% of college students end up at what they would call the wrong college for them because they just don't have enough information before they go to make a real decision other than like, oh, it has like a cool dining hall or the girls were pretty or like I like their swimming pool or some, you know, relatively meaningless component when you're 17 and you're like, I, you know, yes. I don't know. So I know you competed in crew, so you have some type of a of a mm -hmm. of an understanding of when you're recruited. It's it's a very different model. You come in for 48 hours, you get the best of the best. They've got your whole visit lined up. You're going to run into the the right people at the right all time. The, all the good, all the good things. So I'd say it wasn't that I didn't like the place I was at, but it was certainly an understanding of wow, this did not end up being what I thought it was when I was recruited, and many of my peers are validating that as well. And I would think that's 90 percent of athletes and people, by the it, way. Yes, absolutely. And by the way, I, I ended up transferring to another institution. Um, I had an amazing experience. And the ironic part was that was a school I had previously denied twice, citing all the reasons I didn't think I wanted to go. The weather, the facilities, the conference, the uniform colors. And what I learned there that actually seeded a lot of the company today is what drives experiences are not the externals, it's the intangibles. It's the people, it's the culture, it's the relationships. This is not true for sports, just sports. This is true for any organization, right? The people you're with are what drives your experiences. So um, that was significant for me in, in realizing what our platform could help demonstrate. And then back to your earlier question, when I met with an athletic director and pitched them on this concept, the reaction was, well... I probably wouldn't air my dirty laundry publicly for recruits to see, but as an AD, this is an invaluable list of information that we could use to better measure our culture and experiences. And then he used the magic phrase and I'd pay money for this. So it helped me quickly understand where's the, where's the market in need. Where's the value proposition, which is to help an, an athletic director have a better culture at the end of the day. You're really talking about a, 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 a a metric to measure culture as opposed to assets, buildings. And yeah, totally. And, and frankly, the people that can make a difference quickly. I mean, these are the folks that are on the ground that if there is an issue, they can address it or a resource that needs to come in versus, you know, sometimes those public facing measures are after the fold and it's just people brain dumping and venting and it can't be, it can't be changed at that point. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that in terms of a marketing 
it's not that that, that you're going to see the red flags by virtue of looking through this in the glass door sense, but the but the organizations that get the really good scoring and have good cultural scores will actively use the data to recruit and market. They could. I mean, we're, we're not in the weeds at that point, but if they yeah. wanted to pull up a screen and say, hey, this is our scores on real response, we have heard it happening. And it, it certainly makes sense from our perspective. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit of, you know, I'm going to take advantage of your athletic career and your technology business to ask you a question that's not directly related to your company. Sure. Where do you come down on compensating college athletes? Because if I was a college division one college athlete, which I was not talented enough to, to be as such, but if I was a division one college basketball player or football player, which are really the two commercial properties of university athletics yeah. in a world of monetized content and monetized eyeballs, I would, my number one complaint would be, you guys are making a, a billion dollars and you're paying us, uh, you know, tuition, room and board. Yeah. It, it's nonsense. Yeah. You know, I'd say I'm, I'm still, I'm still learning based upon, especially in the last two years, the result of these changes that the NCAA has made. I'm a strong believer these changes need to happen. Um, and I'm glad they did um, with the NIL and, and, and some of the things that have happened as a result you know, the, the, the challenge is the question I always had in my mind is why were student athletes different? Why was a student athlete different than the the actor that attended a university that was allowed to go be in movies and, and promote themselves in that way? Um, why didn't they have a similar constraint in, in, in handcuff while being on campus? At the same time, the coaches that are around us having significant compensation models and now even the athletic directors you know just never made sense when i watched a team win a championship and i'm not discrediting these people at all but you have a student athlete that gets a t-shirt and maybe a cool you know speakers or at my time it was like the headphones and things like that you get and then a academic counselor getting a bonus based upon it right it just it never made sense like why wasn't there a bonus structure across the i don't think it makes sense to anybody who's outside of it quite yeah. honestly yeah so I, I think it's fantastic now that student athletes are making money off their name image and likeness i do believe we will get to the point where compensation and and, and payment needs to happen on top of that as well when you look at the fair market value of these individuals and the enterprise value of what, of what they are in. Um, I do believe it's a little bit inflated. Um, I think the people that are going to get the most attention are the 1%. It's the elite, elite quarterback. It's the elite college basketball player. It's well, it's culturally disastrous. I mean, that, because the thing is to the degree to which you want to have any cohesion on the campus. Yes. And all of a sudden you've got whoever the big man or big woman is, whether it's the quarterback or whether it's the lead, whatever, the point guard or whoever making, you know, five, ten million dollars a year because that's fair market because of the size of the audience and the thing. It creates a, a it tears the fabric of the campus, I would imagine, is the is the downside. Yeah, I think most student athletes were probably naive with thinking about how much money they would actually make. And it is these elite elite one percent that are going to likely be in the professional sports rank the following year for its other sports a few years after that i just i believe when you when you look at the value of what they're creating for the institution in my mind it it, it is totally okay for them to be compensated as a result of that whether it's the nil or soon to be you know potentially a direct pay as well um but I think the equilibrium will fall where it's supposed to be over time when you look at, you know, what are people willing to spend on who and then how much value are they creating as a result? Is there any negative that you see? Like if you just uncorked it completely and allowed the 0.01 percent, you know, because everybody knows for all however fabulous a Division One sports team is, the number of players on a Division One sports team who will be successful in the pros has got to be minuscule. Um, meaning most division one athletes do not have long pro athletics careers. Sure. You know, what is the, what is the reality of student athlete compensation look like in your mind? I don't think we know yet. Um, and I think 
there are pros and cons with any type of decision and and, and, and results. So I think it'd be naive to say there wouldn't be any negatives. Um, but the reality is we need to understand, and this is why I mentioned in the beginning, I'm still learning based upon just the data and what's coming out. But I think we need to learn what the negatives are. But once you know what the negatives are, you need to be able to get ahead of it and address it. So if it is, you know, the cultural sense that you mentioned or 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 some of those other things that could happen, you know, how do we educate those people on the front end? How do we equip them for success? Like what are other guardrails that we can put into effect to avoid it? But, you know, the reality is that there's con- potential consequences with everything. I mean, you've got young music stars that are making buttloads of money at 16, 17, 18, and it's similar challenges, right? Like you have to be able to educate them and equip them to be successful in society. And it's about, and I think actually college athletics is in a better position to help these people because you do have adults and resources around and coaches more directly involved in life to be able to help guide people to that process where ultimately they're, they are educated and independent on, on some of those matters. So what's next for real response? Yeah, we, we have a lot going on. Um, and 2022 was really a, a catalyst year for us. I'll take a few steps back just so you can understand our, our growth the last few years. So we were exclusively with college athletics from 2016 to 2020, um, grew to 100 plus schools across the country. We always knew there was a bigger opportunity outside college athletics. And you previewed this well earlier because the types of things we deal with are not unique to college athletics. Um, it actually fell in our lap with COVID. Uh, We got connected with the NFL Players Association, who at the time was looking for a way for their players to be able to bring forward COVID concerns and COVID protocol violations. This was the time you might remember with the NFL where they wanted to have games, but if there was a protocol violation, someone wasn't wearing a mask or they snuck out of a hotel on a away game or whatever, like the game was canceled and it had massive revenue implications. So we created a solution for them to help create accountability for that. Um, it went extremely well the next year. So 2021 in the summer, they expanded it beyond COVID to any health and safety concern that a player might have. And that was really the launch pad into pretty significant and quick growth beyond college athletics. So we began to partner with Olympic national governing bodies, USA Gymnastics, USA Swimming and others. We began to make inroads in pro sports. We mentioned the clubs already. We now are working with a dozen NFL teams in that kind of HR and legal space. We're working with several pro sports clubs now, or pro sports leagues rather. Um, last year, Major League Baseball announced their implementation of our system, as did NASCAR. Several of the international integrity groups um, are also bringing on our system. So I, I'd say right now, if you look at our if, as we continue the traction of 2022 and into 2023, we're making strong inroads internationally. We had our first partner announce in January that they'd implement our system beyond the U.S. Um, and then I'd say also we're we're beginning to see inroads with campuses uh, beyond athletics. So we've always had this question of could real response be used beyond the athletic department? Um, and and the answer was always no at the time because we didn't have a product well set up for that until more recently. And we've now had a few universities expand real response beyond the athletic department, servicing groups like Greek Life, Title IX and others, and giving now all students a way to be able to come forward and, and not just the student athletes with needs they might have. Real response, the company, David Chadwick, the boss and founder. It's a reason to uh, pay attention to your class projects, I guess. You're like a uh, a, a great anecdote for every mother and father in the world who says, well, don't, it's, it's not just a class. You can actually make a thing. Look at David. You know, he, he's he's got a whole company now. So um, that's a great compliment, not only to you, but to your university that you are in an ecosystem that gave you the support to build something like this. I appreciate it. I had fantastic professors and all candor. I didn't know what entrepreneurship was at the time. I knew it satisfied a uh, credit requirement that I had. And took the class and fell in love. I did get a B. I, w- I was good at the ideas. I wasn't great with the homework. So <laughs> I had a few points knocked off from that. But yeah, I mean, it, it laid the seeds and, and and ignited a passion for me that we've been able to, to, to be blessed to continue eight years later. Awesome. Well, congratulations. Um, mm-hmm. I'm Dylan Radigan. This is Bootstrapping. You're watching Tasty Live. We're back after this.